Family and fellow soldiers, I'm the professor, and this is the moment of truth. Donald Trump scored a victory this week in Michigan, a battleground state, and one that he carried in 2016. The Michigan State Supreme Court has declined to hear one of those cases that would have tried to disqualify him under the 14th Amendment. This has been a nationwide strategy that the Democratic Party has been pursuing, but it seems to have already run into a number of walls. Other states like Florida, naturally, and Minnesota have also dismissed these kinds of cases. A judge in Arizona dismissed a similar challenge, but only because the judge said that the plaintiff didn't have standing since he wasn't running for office himself. Well, even though in those other cases in Colorado, it wasn't filed by a Democratic candidate, but it seems the GOP, still running low on ideas or any actual policies, has decided that they're going to mirror image what the Democrats are doing and try to remove Biden from the ballot in their states. Naturally, the wackos in Texas have said they want to get in on this, too, because it's an election year and they need money for their fundraising, and this is the quickest way to get it. Now, the reason that they've offered for why Biden needs to be removed from the ballot is because they say he's failed to stop the flood of illegal immigrants, and that qualifies as an insurrection. Or at least that's the only talking point that they've got. This is what both political parties have been reduced to in their efforts to try to win high office without actually going to black people about anything. If either the Democrats or the Republicans were to go to the black voters and actually put something on the table, they wouldn't have to be resorting to this kind of asinine stupidity. And even though the Democrats did win in Colorado, now it's going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. Many of those justices were put on the bench by Trump himself, so I think we can say the fix is most likely in. For the folks who thought that Colorado was going to be the beginning of a landslide against Trump, clearly it's not going to be that simple. Now, I'm not mentioning this because I think that we should take sides. We shouldn't. Neither one of them is bringing us anything, so we shouldn't be rooting for either one. But the fact that this kind of open judicial lawfare has broken out just goes to show both parties are on the same page when it comes to do whatever it takes to win office without offering black people anything if you can avoid it. So, should Trump be taken off the ballot? Only if Biden's doing it so he can guarantee that he's going to accede to our demands. And should the Republicans be able to remove Biden from the ballot? Only if Trump's doing it so that he can guarantee to us the tangibles that he should have promised to us eight years ago. Folks, let's not get carried away here. There are a number of fights, especially under white supremacy, where there's simply no good guys to root for. And in other similar news, Greg Abbott, the Aryan from Texas, he just got one of his rich donor pals to pony up some money for a private jet so that they could take dozens of illegal aliens to Chicago. But not for a tourist trip. They're just basically dumping them there and saying adios. You know, I was mildly amused by how Abbott talked about this. He said that Chicago was obstructing and targeting his busing missions. Mission? Really? He calls these PR stunts missions? Like he thinks he's in a war or something? Well, that's how these good old boys like to talk to each other. The less brain cells, the more likely you are to describe nothing as being a war. Well, if it is a war, as he would like to frame it, then Abbott is clearly a double agent. First off, let's get this straight. Abbott the Aryan isn't pulling these stunts to do black people any favors. If the GOP truly wanted to do something about the illegal aliens, then they should be writing and strictly enforcing laws that would criminalize people who hire them and those who give them housing and the banks that allow them to do money transfers. If the illegal aliens can't find work, can't find anyone who'll transfer money for them or to even get housing, then it's impossible for them to operate. But the GOP is the front office for big business in America, and for them to enforce laws like that would require the GOP to lock up their own donors, and they're not about to do that. Of a necessity, they would have to arrest these agribusinesses who hire illegals, from the farms to the poultry operations, and the restaurants and the landscapers and the construction companies, you get the idea. So you have to forgive me if I'm a little bit dubious that the GOP's turned over a new leaf and they want to actually get tough on illegal immigration. Keep in mind, the new GOP governor of Louisiana, which is right next door to Texas, that guy got caught doing business with a man who brought illegals to work on the soon-to-be governor's own construction project for the government. So while some people may think the GOP actually wants to stop the illegal immigrant tsunami because of these PR stunts, in reality, this is just another football in the game of power politics. Sure, they'll arrange for free flights for illegals because that doesn't require their donors to pay their employees more money. And once the illegals are in Chicago or New York, long as they're outside of Texas, they don't have to worry about anything else, any sort of related cost to take care of them, emergency room visits the like. None of these GOP donors is going to go to prison for hiring them. Don't be fooled. 
You'll know when someone's serious about fixing this problem because they'll push for, pass, and harshly enforce legislation that goes after the businesses, which are the magnets that draw the illegals here, and then setting them up with work and bank accounts when they get to the U.S. And secondly, there's something like 10,000 illegals arriving at the southern border every single day, if not every couple of days. So the couple thousand that Abbott or DeSantis has sent the last year and a half, that doesn't really give any kind of relief to anyone. Though it does get Abbott some headlines, and for him, that's far more important. But for the white left, who have been crowing about how by 2050, Latinos are going to contribute to whites being a minority in the U.S., keep in mind, Mexico's birth rate is in decline. Mexico's own demographers predict that that country's population is going to peak by mid-century and then slowly decline. So about the time that whites in America are going to become a minority, the Mexican population is going to have peaked. So for an economy like the United States, which is addicted to cheap labor from down south, sooner or later these crooked corporations and no-good businessmen are going to have to deal with the fact that they can't depend on a flow of cheap illegal labor forever. And what will they do then? But understand that as the white supremacists see it, no matter what the conservatives may claim, the white left does not see illegal immigration as a counter-lever to entrenched white power. They see it as a counter-lever to the political threat that black people's demands are posing. Though I do get a kick out of watching Brandon Johnson, the mayor of Chicago, complaining about all the illegals being dumped on his doorstep, and of course Officer Eric Adams of the NYPD is also complaining bitterly too, they're both stuck on the horns of a dilemma, because they both put together political support that is comprised of people in their cities who are at most second-generation Americans, and who see the illegal immigrants as their family members in many cases. And for Johnson and Officer Adams, currying the support of people from immigrant backgrounds also gave them a way to ignore black voters and still be able to win office. That's the foundation of their political platforms. Look at Karen Bass in LA for another example. For these guys to take action to stop or even turn away the illegal aliens would be seen by their supporters as a betrayal. So for them, there's no good answers here. And that includes their idiotic appeals to Biden. That geriatric joke doesn't know if he's coming or going. You catch him on the wrong day, he might have a flashback to the 1980s and say, didn't we give blanket amnesty back then or, 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 or something? Both the GOP and the Democrats are basically trying to kick the can down the road. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to both of them when they finally run out of road. And the last of the GOP goofballs that we'll talk about is Lauren Hobart. I mean, uh, Bobert. Right now, she's running away from her own district. Literally. She's fleeing her current congressional district, which is District 3, because her Democratic challenger, who she beat, by the way, last time around, this year he's out fundraised her. And now she's running over the mountains to District 4, where another GOP congressman is retiring, and now she wants to run for his seat, because it's a much redder district. And I think it says a lot that even though in the state of Colorado you don't have to actually live in the district that you're running for office in, Lauren Boebert has nonetheless picked up tent and headed for the hills anyway. This is a Hail Mary from her. But it may not be the winning play she thinks it is. Keep in mind, another big mouth right wing nut, Madison Cawthorn, also found himself in the exact same position last year. He too fled from his congressional district when it became obvious he was going to lose. So he ran to another district. And he still lost. Lauren Boebert's problem is that she's so high profile. People know her, her asinine antics, and that she likes to get down in public places. This woman has just been a scandal magnet, too stupid to stay out of trouble. Madison Cawthorn ran his mouth about the GOP leadership, and that had more than anything to do with his getting crushed in the election. Boebert, however, hasn't crossed anyone other than Marjorie Greene, but the question is, who in the GOP actually looks at her as being the future of the party? Now, the reason that I bring up Trump, Abbott, and Boebert is because they all show us why switching to the GOP isn't an option for us. Both the Democrats and Republicans are pursuing the same political strategy, albeit by different means. Both of them are ready to go to war with each other and having double knockouts in court and engaging in human trafficking and running clear across their own states, all so that they can avoid having to deal with us. Democrats didn't need to resort to the 14th Amendment or any other legal maneuver to beat Trump in 2020. That was because they had black support back then. That's how determined both of them are to avoid the black agenda, and I mean the real one. The GOP isn't offering us anything. We give the Democrats the criticism they deserve because they falsely claim to be for us and yet haven't done anything for us in decades. So the people who you see in the comments writing, I'm voting for Trump, 
My question to them is, why? Just because we've finally begun holding the Democrats to a standard doesn't mean we automatically stop holding the Republicans to one at all. As long as both of the major parties continue to put all of their effort into avoiding having to deal with us, we will continue to put all of our effort into denying them our vote too. Good day, and be one. I'd like to take a moment to mention some of our contributors. Edmund Ramsey, Gregory Franklin, Keegan Compton, Norma Anthony, and Glenda Tice. Salute to them and thank you to everyone for listening, liking, and sharing this message. Black Empowerment only exists because of you.